Hello YouTube and welcome back to Be A Loser. Today we're going to discuss the physiology of fasting. I'm going to warn you that this will contain a lot of science content, but I'm going to keep it simple for this video. In later videos we'll delve much deeper into the underlying science of why fasting works and its numerous benefits. Okay, so let's get started. As we've already discussed, when we eat, insulin levels increase. This allows glucose that we eat to be used immediately for energy. Whatever we don't use is stored as fat in the body and glycogen in the liver. Approximately six hours after we eat, we see the insulin levels start to fall. It's at this point that the glycogen is released from the liver to be used for energy. After 24 to 48 hours of fasting, the liver begins to create new glucose. This process is called gluconeogenesis, which literally means create new glucose. After two to three days of fasting, because the insulin levels are so low, the body begins a process called lipolysis. It, this sounds bad, I know, but it really is a good thing. This is when your body starts to use fat for energy. Triglycerides are broken down and they are used for the energy. For anyone who has ever had a high triglyceride level, you can understand the benefit of this. So after five days of fasting, the body begins to create high levels of human growth hormone, or HGH, to help maintain muscle mass. For those of you who follow sports, you are most likely intimately familiar with HGH. It is a substance used by many athletes to prolong their careers and rehabilitate faster from injury. They use it illegally, but when fasting, we get a free influx of it. That absolutely cannot be a bad thing. This is why many professional athletes exercise in a fasted state. We'll discuss that in detail in a later video, but if professional athletes are doing that, then you can be sure it's not a bad thing. So as we've seen, as we fast, our body uses the food energy glucose that we ate within the first six to 24 hours, depending on the individual, for energy. At this point, when all the glucose is gone, we start to burn our fat tissue. This is important because your body cannot burn both sugar and fat at the same time. It can only use one or the other. This is where most diets get things wrong. They make the assumption that you burn both sugar and fat equally. This is called a one compartment model. Everything is in the same pot and can all come out at the same time. Unfortunately, our bodies aren't that simple. The human body is a two compartment system, meaning there is glucose, sugar, and there is fat. They are separate. So let's use another one of Dr. Fung's analogy, shall we? Think of the sugar that you eat like money in your wallet. It, it's readily available and it's easy to refill, but holds a small set amount. Now think of fat as the money in your bank. It's much, much more difficult to get to, but it holds virtually an unlimited amount. As long as we have money in our wallet, we have no need to take money from the bank. And so it is with the body. As long as we keep supplying the body with glucose, then we never have any need to use our fat for energy. Now, for people with normal insulin levels, this isn't really a problem. But if you aren't using all of the glucose that you consume as energy, then the rest is stored as fat and it's never used. And the only way to get that stored money in the bank, by which of course I mean our fat tissue, is by fasting. This shift from burning glucose, compartment one, to burning fat, compartment two, is seen in fasts as short as 24 to 36 hours. In fact, studies show that 
fat burning increases by 70% over a three-day fast, and that 70% of that occurs in the first 24 hours. So even with a 24-hour fast, you gain 70% of the benefit of a longer fast. But not all fasts need to be that long. Shorter fasts, what we call intermittent fasting, have been shown to improve insulin sensitivity. This means that the longer that you do these shorter fasts, the less insulin your body will produce in response to what you eat. So there are foods that also reduce the secretion of insulin, most noticeably low carbohydrate, high fat foods. Now, this should sound familiar as I referred to it in the last video, and I also referred to it as the first key of weight loss in my channel intro video. However, while these foods keep insulin levels lower, they do nothing for insulin resistance. Again, this was occurring in me. As I stated in the channel introduction, my blood labs confirmed that my diet was controlling my cholesterol levels, but not my glucose. Over the years, I had clearly built up insulin resistance, and my LCHF diet, while healthy, could not counteract that resistance. This is also why I saw initial weight loss on my low-carb, high-fat diet, but ultimately not long-term. With the insulin resistance, the body set weight, BSW, remains high. So the only way to reduce and reverse this insulin resistance is with the complete abstinence of food. And that, folks, is why we fast. It worked for me, and I guarantee it will work for you. Honestly, all of this boils down to a very simple question with an even simpler answer. Think about it, if you ask a six-year-old the question, how do I lose weight? The answer will be, don't eat, duh. All right, well, that's going to do it for this video. Next time, we'll discuss who should and who should not be fasting, as well as the numerous different types of fasts. As always, please like, comment, and subscribe. We really enjoy hearing from you. And until next time, keep being a loser.